Hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're working on a, a subject now. Pardon me? Oh, I thought you uh, said something, Jackson. Uh, we're, we're studying the topic of heaven, and this is the ninth episode in that series. So if you haven't seen the first eight episodes, they're available on my uh, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. The source material that we're using for this, besides scripture, uh, is the book by Randy Alcorn, titled Heaven. So as we go through the book, uh, we're discussing it. And uh, let me let me welcome the panelists uh, here and uh, introduce yourself. Please, Eric. Uh, yeah, uh, Brother Eric here. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 I'm very happy to be and privileged to be part of these conversations with our brothers on, uh, on our group here. Um, hopefully uh, we can... Uh, you know, spread the word of God very, you know, um, very well today. Let the Lord lead us, and um, and uh, let's see what we can uh, see. What we can talk more about heaven. It's very, very uh, thought provoking and very, you know, spirit filled uh, discussion. It's very, very been a very good discussion. Yes, uh, there's no more positive subject to discuss. So thank you for joining us, uh, Brother Eric. <laughs> I thought I thought I'd try to inject a little levity right off the bat, <laughs> and we got we got Brother Jackson here with us also. Hey there, my name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero, and I'll, I'll, I, I guess I'll just make this public. I met Brother Austin in person, and that was really cool. Yeah. That's wonderful. You guys, are you, are you both tw 20 years old now? He's 20 and I'm 21. 21, okay. All right, that's very good. Okay, and uh, we talked to Austin on the phone, and he, he may be joining this uh, discussion here within the next uh, hour or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're uh, starting on Chapter 11 uh, in Randy Alcorn's book. He has a quote here from someone named John Updike. I don't know who John Updike is, but let's read his quote. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's disillusion did not reverse, the molecule, molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fail. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence, uh, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. John Updike. All right, well, he certainly is defending the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Um, why do you think uh, that's an important statement to make? I think that um, that's maybe one of the better quotes I, I've read in the book. Um, I'm only about halfway through the book. Uh, I plan on kind of finishing up with you. I'm kind of holding out to finish it up and learn some things with you. But um, uh, that's one of the better quotes I'd heard uh, because there is so much, so many other topics which because of um, – we talked a lot about this with Mitch and with Jackson before, where you know this uh, this metaphorical speaking or analogies or talking in a way that's that's transcendent or it it just speaks of heaven in such a way that it's that way. I think the natural inclination sometimes is to is for that to step uh, step down and then it starts applying to other parts of scriptures that we that we have always believed to be physical, true, and Christ's bodily resurrection is definitely a part of that. We don't want that at all to ever become something that starts slipping into, um, you know, symbology or metaphor. You know, metaphor. It, it, it's it's a clear cut case that this was a physical resurrection, and to me, everything. Everything hinges on that in the rest of creation because Christ is showing us as the first fruits of resurrection what resurrection is all about, and it is something physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's all very, very true. Uh, but 
why why does it even need to be stated that it was a bodily resurrection? I, I, I mean, I have a an, an idea in my head, but why do you why do you think it's even necessary for you to even make such a statement? By maybe there are some people who don't believe that it was a bodily resurrection. There are people who believe it was uh, it was something that was symbolic or metaphorical. Yeah, and that is just a few. Yeah, that is part of Gnosticism. The fact that uh, they believe that everything physical is evil, and right. he just was not raised physically uh, because uh, that would be that would be evil. All physical matter is evil, and they believe it, it was is all spiritual, uh, and that was that was uh, taught against in I don't remember which epistle, but uh, there's a point uh, in the epistles where it is defending this bodily resurrection of Jesus, and uh, that it was not just a spirit. Um, Okay, Jackson, do you have any comment on that quote? Um, none other than just, I guess, mirroring what Eric said right there and everything. You know, the, I think oftentimes they, you, you have to be specific because people will take something and kind of mold it like clay to sort of some other philosophy, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yes. Well, we know that, that Paul said, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain and we're the most... Uh, to, our Pity, most, pitiable of people. Yeah, we should be pitied more than anybody else because right. we're we're putting our faith in something that is not that is not true. Right. Uh, if there was no resurrection, so the resurrection is uh, what to me. I, I've said this many times. Every time I talk about the resurrection, to me, the the most important significance of the resurrection is uh, Jesus was asked for a sign by the by, by the Pharisees. And this was after he'd already raised people from the dead and healed them and fed them and done turned water to wine. He's in all these miracles. It's all public knowledge, and they're demanding he have a sign to prove who he is. <laughs> so that's really stupid in the first place if they're asking for a sign after all he's already done. But because they were demanding a sign, he, he said, the only sign that I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. Right. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And right. this he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Right. And so he said that this resurrection is the sign that he was going to give to prove to everybody he is, in fact, God who has power over life and death. And so... Uh, that is the significance of the resurrection. Because of the resurrection, I feel justified in believing in Jesus. I feel, I feel Jesus, proved, Jesus proved to me he is worthy of my faith and trust in him because he showed that he does have power over life and death. Okay, now the next uh, um, part of the book I'll read is Marcus Borg, a Jesuit seminar leader, said this of Christ's resurrection, quote, As a child, I took it for granted that Easter meant that Jesus literally rose from the dead. I now see Easter very differently. For me, it is irrelevant whether or not the tomb was empty, whether Easter involves something remarkable happening to the physical body of Jesus is irrelevant. <laughs> Actually, first, uh, first Corinthians chapter fifteen is the first thing that comes to my mind that totally contradicts that when he says that you are being saved unless you believed in vain, and in vain referring to that not happening and everything. Yes, yes, uh, uh, and that that's what I was alluding to in my my statement about the resurrection, and that uh, we we be we're the most. What was the word again? Pitied. We should be the most pitied of all people uh, if, if the resurrection didn't happen because we're putting our, our faith in something that is, is not true. Uh, so, uh, but this here's a Jesuit priest, seminar leader. Uh, yeah, and he's a, a mem member of the Jesus Seminar. They're this special mm -hmm. group that comes together and makes. I think I think those are the guys who. Um, Come together and they they get together on a regular basis, yearly, annually, or something like that. And they they make decisions on whether they believe Jesus actually did or actually said some things that he did. 
Oh, okay. I'm, I'm glad you yeah, uh, corrected yeah, me. Yeah, Jesus uh, seminars. It's it's not at all like a conservative evangelical. Oh no, 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 no. It's no just these the guys. Are, oh yeah, yeah. They they, they 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 basically vote on whether they think an event and what's in the Bible actually happened or whether it didn't or whether it's. Yeah, you know, they just vote on it. They vote with these, I think, like colored beads or something. They put it into something. It's something like that. And they, but they they get together in a group and they decide what was actual truth and what's not. What he might have said, didn't say, and I'm probably glad you, didn't say. Uh, I'm glad you said that because um, I'm I'm having a hard time reading today. That first thing I read by John Updike, I kind of tongue tied reading it. That's okay. <laughs> and now, as I read this, I actually misread it. So you're correct. I called him a Jesuit. Right, no. That. It was close. <laughs> <laughs> it says, a Jesus seminar leader, not a Jesuit. But the, but, but the word there I think we should focus on there is, and, and your point is still well taken, because the, the word we got to focus on there is leader. Yeah. And that's why, I, and that's why I always poke fun at these people who are leaders, quote unquote, theological seminaries. They go, they, they come out with some of the stupidest comments that I've ever thought. And the funny part is, it's like you know, he had it right the first time. He had it right when he was young, and then in that, for him to turn around and say that that event is irrelevant, I mean, it's just it's utterly ridiculous. His, I don't think his belief rests in anything. It's just that that's just well, like. It just goes to show, and we like this should humble us all that it's possible to go from truth to error on something. Something oh. like, like you, oh, you correct yourself, it's always right. No, sometimes you've got it right the first time. That's yeah. absolutely true, Jackson. Yeah. Okay, and then it. Uh, I'll read on. It says, as a child, Borg. Uh, that's the that same Jesus seminar leader. Borg was right. As a child, as an adult, though considered a spokesman for Christianity. He couldn't be more wrong. What Borg calls irrelevant, the physical resurrection of Christ's body, the Apostle Paul considered absolutely essential to the Christian faith. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, quote, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, and we are to be pitied more than all men. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 and 19. So there's the verse, there's the quote that Randy Alcorn saw the the, uh, the relevancy of that verse as, as Eric pointed out earlier. Yeah, <clears throat> then he says, it says, the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of redemption, both for mankind and for the earth. Indeed, without Christ's resurrection and what it means, an eternal future for fully restored human beings dwelling on a fully restored earth, there is no Christianity. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, not only that, it, uh, this word physical uh, resurrection, um, I, I, I think that uh, uh, there are a lot of people that, that claim that there's a resurrection, but they don't feel the need to put bo raised bodily, raised from the dead bodily. Uh, they don't want to, either maybe they don't really understand the, uh, the importance of that distinction, uh, or maybe they just don't realize the way they wrote it is not strong enough. But this is a bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus' body. And and this physical component to it is is important because that shows us that in our resurrection, which is going to be like his, the Bible says, will also be physical. So we're going to have physical bodies. And then Randy also says this physical aspect of resurrection, should we should understand that this applies to earth too. The earth is going to be restored, <laughs> renewed, resurrected in eternity. Uh, for this new heaven and new earth, it's physical. So that's another thing that shows us that we're not going to be spending eternity out in outer space in some dimension that's non-physical. Mm -hmm. I think there's another important thing here um, about what we're talking about right in this point. <clears throat> and, and here's Paul, and it's he hinges everything on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Um the, if, if this is for a man who has total faith. This because remember, this is a man who was not there. He did not see the resurrection. He was not there for the resurrection. He wasn't with the apostles when the resurrection happened. Okay, so he didn't see this happen. He he later 
was exposed to Christ when uh, when he had his Damascus uh, experience, his Damascus Road experience. But he wasn't there to see all this happen. So for him to go back, you know, he's he's saying, hey, you know, weigh what we're saying in the balances. What Christ did at the resurrection, this is this it hinges on everything that he bos- that he resurrected. And I think it says a lot to his faith. It says a lot to what he believed and knew this to be true. Mm-hmm. I uh, I don't know where it is offhand. But uh, I believe when they were choosing the apostle to replace Judas, uh, the cri- one of the criteria was they had to be an eyewitness to the resurrection. And uh, uh, so this is this is so important that in order to be apostle, you had to actually see the, see the risen Christ. And of course, Paul did that uh, through his. Uh, on the road to Damascus, Jesus mm-hmm. appeared to him. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, the major Christian creeds state, quote, I believe in the resurrection of the body, unquote. But I have found in many conversations that Christians tend to spiritualize the resurrection of the dead, effectively denying it. They don't reject it as a doctrine, but they deny its essential meaning, a permanent return to a physical existence in a physical universe. Of Americans who believe in a resurrection of the dead, two-thirds believe they will not have bodies after the resurrection. But this is self-contradictory. A non-physical resurrection is like a sunless sunrise. (laughs) There's no such thing. Resurrection means that we will have bodies. If we didn't have bodies, we wouldn't be resurrected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just goes back to the same point that we've made over and over again. And now that we're about one fourth of the way through this book, uh, I expect that uh, we'll continue making this same point over and over and over again. And that, in fact, is the fact that Christianity as a whole, Christendom, those who name Jesus as, as uh, their Savior, Lord and Savior, say, they, they, uh, their understanding of these things is, is so off. They mm-hmm. do not understand that, that uh, our eternity is going to be on the earth with physical bodies. They think we're going to be in, in some uh, non-physical dimension with, without bodies, just spirit beings. So this is just another example that, of the ignorance mm-hmm. of the, all the members of the church. I, I would say probably 90% of all professing Christians are, are misinformed or ignorant of these facts. And I think a lot of that has to do, unfortunately, with, with the lack of the lack of study of Scripture. They, they simply do not study the Scripture the way they should, and so they don't know it. And so when it comes to, you know, we're called to be ready to defend the faith, and this is part of defending your faith, defending the realistic you know aspects of the resurrection, what's going to happen to us when we're resurrected, heaven as it is, and looking at these things as very real and not symbolic, but very real things that you can explain in such a way that people understand. And I think the world looks at that and it makes it more unbelievable because people simply do not study and they don't they don't learn what they need to about these topics. Mm-hmm. The uh, the bibl- biblical doctrine of the resurrection of the dead begins with the human body, but extends far beyond it. R. A. Tory writes, quote, We will not be disembodied spirits in the world to come, but redeemed spirits in redeemed bodies in a redeemed universe. Unquote. If we don't get it right on the resurrection of the body, we'll get nothing else right. It's therefore critical that we not merely affirm the resurrection of the dead as a point of doctrine, but that we understand the meaning of the resurrection we affirm. Is what he's saying that we that our resurrection, our bodily resurrect, re- resurrection, is kind of like an emulation of Christ's re- resurrection? Mm-hmm. And again, obviously, it's him doing it; it's not us doing it. But the whole made in, like becoming Christ's image, kind of thing, having a sinless new nature, and all that stuff. Yeah, and, I, I, when you ask the question, uh, is what he's saying? Are you referring to this last quote I just made, or Randy Elkhorn? Yes, in his book? The, the last quote. Um, I don't know if that's the point he's making in that quote, uh, but but I do agree with your point that okay. our, our the resurrection of the church, uh, you and I 
when we have our resurrected glorified bodies, I think we're going to find that there are verses as we go through this study, there are verses to support the fact that our resurrected bodies are going to be just like Jesus' resurrected body. His was the first fruits mm -hmm. of the resurrection, and right. he's the first, and we're going to be just like him. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that includes some abilities that we don't now have physically, uh, and maybe the ability to leap tall buildings in a single bound, uh, <laughs> who knows? But we will be superior physically, have other physical abilities, and we certainly will be sinless with no sin nature. I think we're going to find scriptures to support that. <clears throat> and Genesis 2 7 says, quote, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, unquote. The Hebrew word for living being is nephesh, often translated soul. The point at which Adam became a nephesh is when God joined his body, dust, and spirit, breath, together. Adam was not a living human being until he had both material and immaterial components. Thus, the essence of humanity is not just spirit, but spirit joined with body. Your, body. your body does not merely house the real you. It is much a part of you as your spirit is. Now this is, <clears throat> this is a really interesting uh, idea he's putting forth here, and it's actually uh, different than the way I've presented it in the past to people. I I've used the Kind of the analogy is that uh, um, I, we do, does every person have a vehicle? Uh, you you own a vehicle, uh, Eric? Of course, mm -hmm. a motor vehicle. Uh, Jackson, you own a motor vehicle? I do. I have a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Okay. And what kind do you own, uh, Eric? If you don't mind me asking. Oh, I have a Jeep Wrangler. <clears throat> oh, you both have Jeeps, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I and I have a, a Jeep. Chrysler Sebring. <laughs> so, so is ha owning a Jeep part of the essential to Christian doctrine? <laughs> no, a Chrysler, Chrysler Sebring is not a... <laughs> but the point is, okay, we get in that vehicle, and, and that vehicle is something that we enter into so that we, it can transport us around, and we move about in the vehicle. And, uh, and some people... Uh, if we were to take a poll, we find that some people have a, a, a really brand new, fantastic, like a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes, and other people have a Chevy or a Ford. Some people have an old used, uh, you know, a uh, uh, thing that's barely, barely running anymore. And I've always compared this getting into that kind of motor vehicle as us uh, using of our physical bodies as a vehicle to move about in the world. That. Uh, uh, some people are born with kind of a Ferrari. These are the most ath athletic people, you know. Uh, other people are born with, uh, uh, let's say, a, a lesser, a less desirable vehicle. And those are the people that have a lot of physical problems or don't have a lot of physical aptitudes and strengths. Uh, and, and I said, just as just as your motor vehicle uh, is doomed to break down and go to the junk heap someday. No matter how much you try to take care of it, eventually the parts fail, and if you can't keep on replacing the parts, eventually it's junked. And that's the same thing with our body. So I look at the motor vehicle as something that we enter into and use as a vehicle to transport us around, and I say that the human body is the vehicle for our soul to be transported around until the body gets goes to the junk heap. You know, uh, That's how I've always compared it. But I, I, I've really come to the conclusion, I, I agree with Randy Alcorn's point here, that you know, the, the body is more important than just to provide tr temporary transportation for 70 or 80 years on the earth. We, we need a body in eternity. We will have a body in eternity that doesn't get old and break down and parts wear out. It's going to be a glorified uh, body like we have now, but perfect. And it, it's, it's essential to make us who we are, a human being, because a human, a person, is more than just a spirit or soul. Body is part of, of the components of being a human being.
I wonder, though, if there'll be any way in heaven, like, to leave your body or something. Just to, like, you've know, heard of out-of-body experiences. I I don't think, to, to me, I don't, I don't think you'd need to. I don't no think you would to. need to either, but it's just always kind of been an adventure that I'm curious about. Uh, of course, but well, of course, would never uh, pursue. <laughs> you've got people who do those things. It's a cult and whatnot. A lot of times, but no, uh, I, I wouldn't say that. I think there's, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think there's a lot of things that we're not going to be able to do, like for, or not know we're going to be able to do. I mean, for instance, you know, Christ was, Christ was, you know, of course, what I believe when he returned in his resurrected body, he was giving us a, a taste as the forerunner. You know of 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 who of who was resurrected, showing us a picture of what we were going to be like in the resurrection, the first fruits of the resurrection, and so we could be. And we talked a little bit about this last time. Luke has mentioned a little bit about this, as far as the vastness of the universe. You know, to be in a thought, to be in a place, from one place to the other. You know, not to have to worry about traveling millions of light years, which takes. Time, so much time that we couldn't conceivably do it reasonably as human beings, but in those bodies we could, uh, you know, possibly be in a thought in the blink of an eye. We could it, be from one place to another. Um, we can appear in a room that's closed. We can do certain things with that body. It's a body that will never die, never be corrupted. So, but yet and yet physical because it's still made. Like Luke was saying, we were made. I I I have heard a lot of people say what Luke was saying about it's almost like you're in a car type of thing and, and it's, that you're, uh, you're using that as your vehicle and then you're going to leave it and everything, but not really. I mean, we've never known life without our bodies. It's always been life with our bodies until we die. I think one of the problems people have is and I'm trying to be fair about this too, because we we speak a lot about Christians saying that you know a lot of damage that Christians have done because they say the wrong things. But at the same time, I think I think for human beings it's difficult to it's difficult for them to accept a concept sometimes when they're not familiar with the concept. So, so the idea of being physical after we die, and you know, we, when people die, they're not physical anymore. We don't see them physically anymore. You know, so it's kind of a hard concept for some people maybe to kind of get a hold of. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, um, even though I've used this automobile analogy uh, over the years. Uh, I also was perfectly aware of the resurrection and our permanent glorified bodies, mm -hmm. but I never, I never really uh, understood the significance and necessity of having a body along with our soul to mm -hmm. make us complete, a complete person. And I'm wondering if you would also agree at this point that we're not really a complete person unless we have a body. That's the point. One of the points he's making here. That's exactly right. We we were made to be that way. That's how man was made originally. Without sin, without sin, we were made to be that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if this idea seems wrong to us, it's uh, because we have been deeply influenced by Christoplatonism. From a Christoplatonic perspective, our souls merely occupy our bodies, like a hermit crab inhabits a seashell. And our souls could naturally, or even ideally, live in a disembodied state. It's no coincidence that the Apostle Paul's detailed defense of the physical resurrection of the dead was written to the church at Corinth. Uh, more than any other New Testament Christians, the Corinthian believers were immersed in the Greek philosophies of Platonism and dualism, which perceived a dichotomy between the spiritual and the physical. The biblical view of human nature, however, is radically different. Scripture indicates that God designed our bodies to be an integral part of our total being. Our physical bodies are an essential aspect of who we are, not just shells for our spirits to inhabit. Well, you know, what's interesting is I actually do think the hermit crab analogy it has some truth to it because a hermit crab can leave its shell and still be a hermit crab, but the first thing they try to do is get another shell. They don't <laughs> live happily outside their shell and everything. They don't. For example, when he says I even ideally exist without a body. A hermit crab cannot ideally exist without a shell. When they leave their shell, it's another shell. And I guess I actually do think that's a pretty good analogy with how we are. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a good get. Yeah. Uh, to, I think Eric's done it also uh, with with some of the, his examples. Even though Randy Alcorn overall is doing a great job making his case 
but yeah. sometimes the examples have flaws. They're flawed examples. Well, and you pointed out the flaw in the hermit crab because the hermit crab is even if he doesn't have a shell, he's still a hermit crab and a complete hermit crab. But he just he doesn't have a, a, a house to live in yet. The shell is more like the house that my house. Yeah. Well, what, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, I think we are kind of like hermit crabs with the body and the shell. You know, the her the shell is very, very important to the hermit crab, but the hermit crab is not the shell. That's I guess, I guess unless I, unless I, I can be unless can be proved otherwise, how I think we are with our souls and our bodies. See, I so, think I, I tend to agree with more with Luke was saying about about what Randy is saying, is more that yeah I think our I think what we consider our shells I think they're a lot bigger part of us than we think, mm -hmm. because for, because for instance, I, because we we always equate it with that because well what happens when in in our lives this is what I was talking about before in our lives when people die they go away the shell of the person is left behind their flesh is left behind and that's what we deal with as people, their spirits go. We don't see them. We don't speak with them anymore. We don't communicate with them anymore, and all we have left is the shell. Mm -hmm. Well, but that it's not just a shell, and that's the thing. God, the way I look at it, to simplify it, is this. When God created, you go back to the beginning. Keep it simple and go back to the foundation. The Bible talks about foundations being very important. You know, The foundation is everything. Okay. We'll go back to the foundation. What's the foundation of life as we know it? Well, it's the creation. It's the beginning of creation. It's how God created things. It's how God created man and woman. God did not create a spirit realm for spirit beings to live in here. He didn't make it that way. He created a physical place for physical beings to dwell. And, 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 and because of that, I don't understand why people have this problem accepting the fact that our physical bodies are just the biggest part of us as our, as our souls are a part of us. They are, absolutely, in my opinion. Well, but, but the thing is, that, and, I, and I, I agree, but the, like, the thing about – if I, I've kept pet hermit crabs before. They're actually some of my favorite animals. And, um, <laughs> and you could never have one be happy and stuff if there are no shells for it to be in. Now, how do you determine if they're happy? Are they smiling and laughing? No, they just they just when things are insecure, they die. <laughs> well, uh, that's well. pretty much the way it is. I mean, the thing is, I, I guess I think that the, I always have considered the shell of the hermit crab to be a very very important part. But what, what I'm saying is the fact that it's a shell, in my opinion, or the fact that it's an automobile, in Luke's analogy or whatever, doesn't diminish its importance, in my opinion. Yeah. I guess. Well, actually, and actually, if you think about it, based on what you're saying, the hermit crab, does, the hermit crab doesn't survive without a shell. Yeah. So We don't get around anywhere without it. It doesn't mind. survive without it. Yeah. So it, oh, by itself, it's no good. Well, so the flaw that I saw in the hermit crab example was the fact that when the hermit crab uh, leaves that shell, the the uh, the shell uh, is uh, is physical, but the hermit crab is has a still physical physical body. He's not just a uh, soul or a, a spirit occupying the yeah, shell. Exactly. Yeah, he has a physical body still. So it, it's, it's not a, to, in, in that way to me. It's not a, a, a equal. Uh, yeah, it's, analogy. it's more more like his yeah. his shell is more like a suit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's like a suit. He put he puts he puts an old suit away for a new suit. It's a yeah, it's kind of like the age-old question of is a turtle or hermit crab in this case without its shell naked or homeless? Maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> that's an old question, huh? That's a new question to me. That's I've heard that before. <laughs> okay. Uh, death is an abnormal condition because it tears apart what God created and joined together. God intended for our bodies to last as long as our souls. Those who believe in Platonism or in pre-existent spirits see a disembodied soul as natural and even desirable. Uh, the B Bible sees it as unnatural and undesirable. We are unified beings. That's why the bodily resurrection of the dead is so vital. And that's why Job rejoiced in uh, that in his flesh he would see God. Job 19.26. Could you look that up, Eric? Job 19.26 so we get the whole verse? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Job 19.26. And though, after, this is one of my favorite verses, actually, and it speaks about the resurrection far before its time. 
And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So he's talking about the resurrection. He's saying there's still a body for me that I'm going to see God in, even though the skin worms are going to destroy this body. I'm still going to stand before him in a flesh body. I'm just going to stand before him in a physical body. Mm -hmm. um, which also, to me, there's a very simple question here that people need to answer. If the physical body had, if we were not meant to get physical bodies for from the resurrection, what was the point in Jesus returning in a physical body? Why? Why didn't he just return a spiritual body that was like a spirit that you couldn't touch? And why? What was the purpose? Mm -hmm. Why would he even show us a physical body if it had nothing to do with, with the resurrection or the future? It had nothing. It didn't pertain to us at all in that regard. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, the question is directed to Jackson. Uh huh. <laughs> what? You that was a freaking joke again, Jackson. Oh, I'm just, I just had a joke at your expense. I don't quite understand, but I know, I know. <laughs> the I know. thing is, the thing is, the um, about the bodily resurrection. Does that mean does Jesus have a physical body right now? Then or well, okay, why wouldn't he? He, he okay. He ret he returned with a physical body. He tells the apostles, "Handle me. A spirit does not have flesh and bone, as you see. I have." Why would he have that, and then it has to go away for some reason? Why would he even have it? Why wouldn't he just have appeared? What about like, the father? I wonder. I'm sorry. What about the father? Does he have? No, the Bible never speaks of the father with a physical body. Okay, interesting. And, and and that's those different personalities of the same God in in the persons of Christ, and that's why I kind of equate the people. I say you got you got to think of Christ as the physical link to the spiritual Father. He's 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 what links physical to spiritual, really. I mean, all the physical things were made by him. His physical his physicality manipulated all that and touched all that. He's like the link between the physical and the spiritual Father. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I wonder how that's going to work out. I'm curious. As Jesus said, "I and the Father are one," and and we, we and we've already talked about in another study the, the Trinity and everything. But it's kind of interesting if the if the if the Son has a physical body and the Father does not. That 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 uh, again, I guess, another real strong argument against modalism, you could say. Uh, yeah, um, but and yet when the verse that says that uh, the uh, son was the the firstborn of creation, or is the firstborn over all creation, and some would take that 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 uh, he uh, he came out from the fall, from from God, the the substance of God, that he came out of it in a physical form, uh, and. Uh, but he, he did not always exist in a physical form. But he existed. There's th the, the three persons existed, but then he was manifest in, as, in his physical form uh, at a certain point. But I don't. I don't know. I'm not really. As you, as we've discussed at great length, you know, modalism and trinitarianism. Uh, uh, even though there are some very interesting arguments favoring modalism. There are some flaws in it, and that's why uh, I, I'm still holding to the Trinitarian viewpoint. Mm -hmm. um, okay, when God sent Jesus to die, it was for our bodies as well as our spirits. He came to redeem not just, quote, the breath of life, unquote, which is spirit, but also, quote, the dust of the ground, that's the body. Uh, when we die, it isn't that our real self goes to the intermediate heaven and our fake self goes to the grave. It's that part of us goes to the intermediate heaven and part goes to the grave to wait our bodily resurrection. We will never be all that God intended for us to be until body and spirit are again joined in resurrection. If we do have physical forms in the intermediate state, Clearly, they will not be our original or ultimate bodies. Okay, remember the idea of the intermediate uh, heaven, and uh, the question was asked, do we have physical bodies or not uh, in this temporary heaven? 
and uh, we'd have to go back several episodes to get uh, to get that. Hey, he's uh, All right. he, what do you call it? Luke always does. Let's uh, uh -oh. how that uh, happened. Uh, let me get let me get rid of the one other one here. I'll eject sure. that. <laughs> get rid of that imposter. Okay, that one's a. a See, with, with Luke, it's the glasses, and with Eric, it's the headphones. But I've always got my headphones. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, both. Have a, no, I had a short. A, we I have what we call in the Air Force a short between the headsets. It's a. <laughs> I had a problem there. <laughs> Uh, you know what? That threw me off so much I can't even remember what I was saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, the intermediate. Uh, will we have a body? Oh, yeah. The intermediate heaven yeah. What, what I was thinking. What I was thinking is, it sounds like, in, in Randy Alcorn's opinion, and we'll, we'll go back to your automobile analogy, Luke. It's almost like when we die and go to the intermediate heaven that exists right now. It's almost like putting your car in the mechanic shop. And they say, oh, yeah, it'll be ready in this amount of time. Okay, you go off and do something else and come back to your restored car and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, another way of looking at it, too, is, uh, okay, our, our car is, is in storage in the grave. And yet, while we're in the intermediate heaven, we get a rent-a-car, a temporary rent-a-car to drive around. Yeah. We could, do we have a physical well, it's in the a shop. body? Uh, a temporary physical body in the intermediate heaven. We, I don't think there was a really a conclusion. I, I, a really, we came to a strong conclusion on that question. Uh, he did pretty. I think he proved that. Okay, at least we know there's one physical body in heaven. Jesus. Uh, he talked. We went in great length to proving that Jesus has, still has a physical body in heaven. He didn't just have one on earth, get get resurrected, and then go ascend to heaven and then lose the physical body, he still has one in in uh, in heaven. So if, if there's one, why not the rest of us? And uh, so, but that's uh, something we've already discussed quite great, quite great length. Uh, but here's, he just continues to make this point, and he's persuaded me that the essence of this brother Luke here is uh, this, uh, the completeness of my being is is body soul and spirit uh, I've, I've often used the example of, of man being made in God's image to uh, be analogous to the Trinity uh, God is tri triune uh, Father Son and Holy Spirit and man was created in God's image and therefore we must be triune and we are uh, if you see my body you think that is brother Luke uh, and yet my mind, my soul, my consciousness, that is also the essence of who I am. Uh, and then there's my spirit, which was dead, but was, uh, regen was regenerated, uh, quickened to life when I put my faith in Jesus. Now my spirit is alive, connected to, to God through the Holy Spirit. So now I'm, I'm really a complete uh, child of God, body, soul, and spirit, and yet only one brother Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any views of the afterlife that settle for less than a bodily resurrection, including Christoplatonism, reincarnation, and transmigration of the soul, are explicitly unchristian? The earth uh, the early church waged major doctrinal wars against Gnosticism and Manichaeism, uh, dualistic worldviews that associated God with the spirit realm of light and Satan with the physical world of darkness. These heresies contradicted the biblical account that says God was pleased with the entire physical realm, all of which he created and called very good, Genesis 1. 1 verse 31. The truth of Christ's resurrection repudiated the philosophies of Gnosticism and Manichaeism. Nevertheless, 2,000 years later, these persistent heresies have managed to take hostage our modern theology of heaven. I've never heard the term Manichaeism uh, before. Are you guys familiar with that? No. Am I even pronouncing it correctly? I, I'm not certain what that is. I may have come across it before, but I just it doesn't sound familiar off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the the idea is that uh, the physical, as we've discussed earlier, the physical is not good. 
only spiritual is good. And he and and uh, Randy makes the point in Genesis 131, God says His whole creation is good, and and the the creation is physical. All of creation is physical except for our our our, our spirits, souls. So that's non physical. But everything else in creation is physical, and it's he, God said it's good. Yep. I mean, this this is to me, this is a very refutable argument. I don't even understand why it's coming back. And this again, this speaks to people who are ignorant of the scripture. They don't know scripture. Um, number one, we've covered this before. One of the things that dashes that argument to pieces is God created a physical earth, a physical creation, and Adam and Eve physically. He called all of those things good. If all physical was bad, then they would have been bad. They would not have been good. Um, the other side of that argument is Satan is not physical. So does that make him good? But nobody answers that question. <laughs> He's not physical. Wait, would you ask that question again? Say, is Satan physical? No. So he is. Is he good? <laughs> I was going to do crickets, well, because no one's answering the question. <laughs> no, they won't answer the question because they can't answer the yeah. question. It's a ridiculous. It's a ridiculous statement. It, it, yeah, it, it, the belief point. itself is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's it's so easy to refute this for these, and that that's why these things. And I think <clears> what happens is, and this is what happens when you move away from scriptural centered uh, uh, you know spreading the actual scripture the word of God studying the word of God knowing the word of God the world has moved away from that and so these other views which are not new you know the saying there's no no new thing under the sun these are not new views we've talked about this before these are old views coming back from way back in the Babylonian days Babylonian mysticism these are not new ideas these are old ideas that are returning because people, as time goes, and you, all you have to do is go out and go into the world today because see how ignorant people are of Scripture and of God. And because of that, they can be easily fooled by these ideas again. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with your point there about uh, if, God, if God created the physical world, mm -hmm. and, he, and, and, if, if there, and if the physical world is bad, then God is guilty. For creating something bad, uh, and then comparing it to what we discussed previously with uh, the question of free will. And, well, that's a good point. Uh, no, I'm glad you said that because actually, I mean, I only brought the point up that that he said his creation, his physical creation, he looked upon his physical creation and said it was good. Yeah. So, so yeah. Conversely, the people who were saying that are essentially saying he made something bad. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so God, now, now, case, the God only was, thing I. Had I have to bring up with that that he made something bad. I mean, you can't say because God made uh, a natural substance that it's okay to get high with that substance or something like that. No, that's true. And but but and I can just well, hear some hit like no, I don't know hit more no. hit kind of person saying, "Oh, God made it." So I'm gonna Jackson, smoke it. Jackson, you're absolutely right. You speak like a man with experience. I've been down that road myself, and I know people who have made that very <laughs> argument. There are a lot of things. Well, yeah, but you can make that argument for anything. You know, I mean, um, you know, God made the natural things that we come up with aspirin, like we talked about. But if you take too much aspirin, guess what? It's going to kill you. Too much of anything or something misused in a way it's not meant to be used. Um, and, and those things, uh, something like marijuana, for instance, it has other uses. The fact that you can smoke it to get high doesn't mean you should. Okay, it has other uses. Yeah. So the fact that we manipulate them to do things that we're not supposed to do doesn't dictate that they're bad by themselves. Because it, I mean, I mean, knives are good tools, but we can stab people with them. Guns are good tools, but you can shoot people with them. So, no, you're absolutely right. Just because it's made doesn't mean it in itself bad. Well, I, I also think but, you're leaving out something in the in this uh, link of this thought process, and that is that you're talking about as it is now in a fallen world. That's and true too. When God created everything, there was no poison. There was no bad things like that you're referring to, uh, Jackson. Everything was good, and in the fallen world, some of these good things went bad. You know, but so is God responsible for the bad things? Uh, he didn't make them bad. Uh, that that happened because of the fall, uh, and it gets back to the same point you were talking about. I think it was one or two shows ago. The question came up about free will. This would make God guilty if if God if God created the bad things in the earth, and He would be guilty of that. If God said made a Jeffrey Dahmer do all of his crimes, 
Jeffrey Dahmer has the right to be at the judgment and say, I'm innocent. God, right, you're so it wasn't my fault. God, <laughs> right. you're, you're guilty because you made me do it. You made I, me do all these I, things. I didn't commit right. one sin. I didn't choose to commit one sin. You're the exactly. one that made me do it. Every crime I committed, every sin, God, you caused it. You did it because you controlled me. That's and the you're problem. controlling me to accuse you right now, too. What's that? And you're controlling me to accuse you right now, Jeffrey Dahmer could say. Uh, yes. Yes, but, right. That, that argument yeah. could continue. To but me, that's what... There was, always, there was always some form of death, though. Like, for example, when it says, I give you every green plant, a green plant's alive, and when you eat it, it dies. Yeah, but not in the same, but not in the same way of a, a sentient being. I mean, it, it's, it's not the same thing. I mean, it's, yes, it's alive in that it grows back and that it, it, it replenishes itself. It struggles to live. But, but, but... To live. Yes, but what we know as far as living things, as far as um, but we don't know, but we don't know if those plants again, we don't know if they functioned differently prior to the fall. They, they're they may have, it may have been different then. I mean, we don't know. It's it's not we're assuming that they that they function the way they do now, but that, that that's not necessarily the case. I mean, I think I think from the beginning, God knew that 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 um, Adam and Eve would sin. I think that because he knew, he, 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 going in advance with foreknowledge, knew that this earth would be temporary and everything. So yeah, I, yeah, I see where you're going with that. He yeah. put things in place. He put things in place to kind of prepare for that. Right, even though oh, he absolutely. already knew that they were going to mess everything up and everything. But I think this new earth is probably not even going to have, maybe, maybe we'll eat plants, but they won't be alive some way or something like that. Well, and maybe. Uh, yeah, or, it's, or it's, it can be explained by him in a better way than I can explain. <laughs> <laughs> even an upgrade on original creation, if that makes sense. I, I, th I, think, I think a lot of explanations we're trying to make here, we're trying to explain things as human beings, and, and we have a hard time with it because we just we can't. It's, well, totally, totally. Totally, but what I'm saying is, I think that I, I think this study is is kind of showing this too. I, I do think that there's a lot of restoration in in um, heaven and, and eternity and everything. But like I made the point that everyone seemed to agree with, restoration and upgrade are not mutually exclusive to each other. Oh and no, I I, I agree with you. Think, it's going to be even better than the yeah, original creation. It's, it's going to be both, it, absolutely. And I think I think yeah. we've covered that, Luke. Luke and what he's talked about, and what we've been mm -hmm. going over with this, we've talked about that over and over again. It's a combination of several things. It's a combination of things that we know being restored, and yet new things. I mean, God God is a God of creation. He He's a God of new things, you know. And and so, why would He stop? Making new things after the fact. I mean, I think eternity is going to be about a lot of new things. So, so I think I, that's all part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as you can see, it's very easy as we're pondering all these things uh, to say, well, how does that? Uh, what if you look at it through, let's say, uh, old Earth theory, or, or what if you look at it through the theory of of uh, uh, free will or no free will. I mean, the, the, every 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 time you put on another lens and try to analyze it through that lens, you have a whole new uh, top uh, topic to to consider. So I don't think we're going to necessarily nail down uh, uh, the the best answer every time. But it's, oh yeah, I, and I realize that. I just but what I what I think that I, I mean I don't know about the free will, but what both an old old Earth and young Earth thing could uh, uh, theology could agree on is that this restoration and yet also upgrade uh, working together in, in, a, in a completely perfect synergism, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, now now you're opening up the whole can of words about synergism and monergism, but let's not go <laughs> off on that. Yeah, actually, I wasn't talking about that at all. I was talking about synergizing. <laughs> I know. I, hey, Jackson. <laughs> That was another one of Luke's attempts at humor. <laughs> okay. Paul says that if Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're still in our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. <clears throat> Meaning, we'd be bound for hell, not heaven. Paul doesn't just say that if there's no heaven, the Christian life is futile. He says that if there's no resurrection of the dead, then the hope of Christianity is an illusion. 
and we're to be pitied for placing our faith in Christ. Paul has no interest in a heaven that's merely for human spirits. Ultimately, there is no heaven for human spirits unless heaven is also for human bodies. That's that's pretty uh, declarative there. Uh, and who, who's the most declarative person you know on YouTube, uh, Jackson? Most declarative? Yes. Probably Jack Smack. Yeah, to me this is something like, yeah. this is how Jack Smack would phrase it here. So yeah. Jack, if you're listening here, we're thinking about you right now. <laughs> so yeah. Paul is declaring that, I mean, uh, Randy, Randy Alcorn is declaring this as, a, as an absolute matter of fact the way he's expressing it and he's using Paul to support it at this point that hey if there's no bodily resurrection and that what uh, it, 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 it would uh, deny what Paul is teaching that this significance of the bodily resurrection if if there's just a spirit no bodily resurrection then uh, why does he make sense in a big point about the body being resurrected yeah Wishful thinking is not the reason why, deep in our hearts, we desire a resurrected life on a resurrected earth instead of a disembodied existence as a, in a spiritual realm. Rather, it is precisely because God intends for us to be raised to new life on the new earth that we desire it. It is God who created us to desire what we are made for. It is God who, quote, set eternity in the hearts of men, unquote. That's Ecclesiastes 3.11. Uh, could you look that up, Eric? Ecclesiastes 3.11. Uh, that's in the Old Testament, Eric. Yes. <laughs> Jackson, did you, did you get that, Jackson? What? I just made a joke to Eric. Well, I didn't I know that was a joke. I thought that yeah. was just explaining to him the difference between... Ecclesiastes and Ephesians, because sometimes I've gotten them mixed up. Oh, okay. Uh, which, no, it, which was definitely, it was definitely my uh, attempt at humor. Was that, was that 311? 311. It is God who designed us to live on earth and to desire earthly life, and it is our bodily resurrection that will allow us to return to an earthly life, this time freed from sin and the curse. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, um, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't, I didn't hear that at all. I mean, I heard your reading, but I didn't hear the words at all, because my mind went off somewhere. Could you, That's okay. Would you mind would you my reading again? Not a problem. Uh, a three, uh, I'm reading the right one. Let me make sure I'm reading the right one. 3.11. Um, it says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Okay. He hath set the world in their heart. Okay, so Randy's saying that this verse is making the point that our, our idea of a world, a physical world, a physical reality, is God put this desire in our heart. Uh, hmm. While we're on Ecclesiastes, uh, what what is your how, how would you sum the the, the book Ecclesiastes up? Uh, what, your, what was that? What did you say? The last thing you said. Sum up the word Ecclesiastes. Choose one word to uh, identify or give you the, the point of the book of Ecclesiastes. One word? Yeah. <laughs> okay, use more than one word if you want. If, if you I'm know not... much about, about the book. It's one of those books that... Look... Cynicism. Cynicism? Yeah. Okay, that's similar. I'm going to use the exact word that's in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity. Yeah. In other words, everything in life is vanity apart from God. You know, pursuing our careers, pursuing everything, everything yes. you think that's going to make you happy. In the end, you realize it's just vanity, and what really matters is being connected to God. Yes. Yeah. That's a wonderful that's a good, book. That's as good it is. It's a very neglected book. I wish uh, I, I probably go ought to go back and read it again now. Okay. Um, 
Let me see, where was I? Okay, uh, that's God, God's idea, not ours. Our desires simply correspond to God's intentions because he implanted his intentions into us in the form of our desires. Quote, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Unquote. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Becoming a new creation sounds as if it involves a radical change, and indeed it does. But though we become a new people when we come to Christ, we still remain the same people. The same people. Yeah. Well, that has a lot of significance. A lot of things can be said about that point that he just made. Uh, we're a new person, but we're the same people. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, we... we Constantly are fighting over this new person and this old man, you know, the new man and the old man. That, that's, that's something that within the church there's a lot of arguing going on. And, uh, but he's saying we're essentially the same person because if you're not the same person, uh, then you're not really you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? I just closed my blinds so that the CIA cannot see what we're doing. <laughs> okay. Actually, they have records. <laughs> <laughs> They're listening right now. Uh, he says, Randy says, when I came to Christ as a high school student, I became a new person. Yet I was still the same person I'd always been. My mother saw a lot of changes, but she still recognized me. She still still said, quote, good morning, Randy, unquote, uh, not, who are you? <laughs> I, I was still Randy Alcorn, though, I, though a substantially transformed Randy Alcorn. This same Randy will undergo another change at death, and yet another change at the resurrection of the dead. But through all the changes, I will still be he, be who I was and who I am. There will be continuity from this life to the next. I will be able to say with Job, quote, in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, unquote. That's Job chapter 19. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, I think, important point for us to understand and emphasize the fact that... Uh, uh, if you go to heaven and you you don't have your memories and you don't have you're not essentially who you are anymore, is it really you who went to heaven? It's not really you, is it? Actually, this is a concept I've struggled with for quite a while. Okay. What's I think this? I think some of the people have a problem with that, like something you struggle with, Jackson, because they want to disassociate ourselves <laughs> from who we're going to be later. They, it's a natural thing they, they start to do, and it becomes confusing, and it, it, that's why people have a hard time believing, well, no, I don't think we're going to be physical. It's like, wait, why? why? Well, here's the thing, though, is related to that, but not exactly that, is I feel like being a Christian is kind of like being Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, if that makes sense. I always thought that's a good <laughs> analogy of what it's like, you know. Well, Whereas you know. A non it'll, it's just like being a Mr. Hyde, you know. And it's well, like, in, in a way, isn't that Paul's description? I mean, because he talks about the, the, you, you war with this man, you wrestle with the flesh, yeah, the, 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 the flesh, and the spirit wars with the flesh, and the two people are warring with each, each, you know, each other, and one wins out occasionally over the other. If we allow the flesh to win out, then we'll do things wrong. If we allow the spirit to win out, then we'll do the right thing. So, let's put it this so, way. Yeah. It's very, it's, maybe it's because you know, I became a, became a Christian when I was very, very young, but it's very hard for me to imagine either being singular and it still being me, if that makes sense. What do you mean being singular? Like, like in heaven, I believe, we'll only have a new nature. We won't have the old sinful oh, nature. Oh, okay, right. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's you're right. I guess we can all struggle with that. I don't think anybody really can understand it completely. Uh, but... Uh, what, to me, even though the you know 
the devil made me do it, you know, that old man, that old sin nature that's on this one shoulder that's whispering in my ear, and, and then the Holy Spirit is prompting me to, to do the right things, and you got this argument going on, and, and uh, uh, once this guy's gone, uh, then, uh, then, th then there's just this guy. And so I'm still me, but I'm just not influenced by this guy anymore. Right. Did that make help at all, or is that true or not? I, 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 the thing is, it's just what, what here. Here's what I think the the issue is for me. It's not. It's not. Um. It's not the fact that I I have a hard time seeing that as being true. It's I have a hard time reconciling it with Aunt Randy's statement that. It's gonna like, like for example, he was saying stuff like it wouldn't be. We really say it's you going to heaven if it's a different person, you know. I just I can't imagine being at all like I am in heaven because so much of me is that sinful nature. Oh, I think you're uh, you're really um, you're you're on a guilt trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're uh, reading way too way too hard on yourself. Uh, uh, you know, some people are way too easy on themselves. You know, they 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 think that they oh they got com absolute control. They got this sinless perfection going on. They haven't. <laughs> one guy says he hasn't sinned for the last forty years. And, oh yeah, that. Guy. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh. So, but but you you know you're you're giving it too much credit, and, and I, I think your identity um, in Christ is far far greater. Uh, unless you've got some total secret thing going on in your life that we don't know about here, maybe you want to talk about that. I don't, <laughs> Is this I don't, an attempt at humor? It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. There you it go. Was. There you go. Okay. You're you're getting the gist of it now. No, I think I think Jackson's point's really more. We're we're so we're so used to this being a part of us that it's it's hard to imagine ourselves without it. Here's, here's um, yeah, because let, let me let me just you know I I was I was listening to some of Jack Smack 77's sermons uh, last night or whatever, and he has a sermon about um, why he doesn't think saved people should buddy be all buddy buddy with lost people. This is an interesting sermon. You can go listen to it. Anyone who's watching, but it's kind of his older ones. I just happened to stumble across it, but. He he said something that I, I I can experientially think is kind of tr I, I can experientially see as being true. Not that I would I I, I guess I'll, I'll get your guys' thoughts on it. But you know a, a saved person who lives in you know a cesspool of carnality is going to be miserable and hurt, whereas a lost person can just love it and not feel any guilt for it whatsoever and that right. kind of thing. And yet, the, the the Christian who's doing that is giving in to the fleshly nature, which still does have something in it that their fleshly nature does want to keep continuing and doing that, like the carnal Corinthians and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, well that that's exactly right. That's exactly right, Jackson. And and his what he's what what Jack Smack was alluding to was the verse in the scripture, and we are commanded that we were told that we should not. Um, yoke, uh, what what the Bible says is unevenly yoke ourselves with unbelievers. Which means we should not make the majority of time that we spend in our lives with unbelieving people, because you know, hanging out with them, and we're not talking about trying to witness to them, doing things like that. We're talking about, we're talking about hanging out with them, doing things with them, going along with them in the things that they do. We should not unevenly do that, because we are going to be more inclined to tantalize ourselves with those things. We're going to be, and, and our fellowship. Is going to be strained with God. We're, we're never going to. You're not going to grow. You're going to reach a point where, like Luke talks about, the people you get the people who become saved, and then they stay carnal and they never grow, and so they never experience a life that they could have had walking in with in fellowship. What we talk, what we call walking in the spirit, not for salvation. We're talking walking in the spirit in fellowship. Yeah, we're talking, like First John. You, right. You you would never understand. You'd never know the blessings of that, and you won't have a good relationship. It would be like, and I know I equate this to a lot of things, but it, the fact is that it's it rings true. It's like your relationship with a father, a son's relationship with a father. We're guys here, so I'll say sons, okay? So it, I could be real rebellious towards my father and do everything that I want to do and have a really, really bad relationship with my father. I'm still his son, but – my relationship with my father is going to be really strained. He's not going to want to do any things with me. You know, he's not going to want to have part of my life and have to do anything to do with the things that are going on in my life because of what I'm doing. Well, it's it's that kind of thing. It puts a strain on your relationship. It puts a strain on that 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 father son relationship to his child. 
Well, but the, the other thing that I just, I guess, have a hard time imagining is just think about, think about, you know, the, I think as Christians we can all think of probably even long periods when we walked in the flesh and hopefully also long periods where we walked in the spirit as a general pattern. I'm not going to lapses here and there. But when you're walking in the spirit, you know, you have great joy, but notice how hard it is also at the same time. It's not an easy walk because you've got all the temptations and everything. And then walking in the flesh and just feel horrible and everything. Maybe a large part of heaven will be walking in the spirit without there being any of the fleshly temptations or something like that. Well, my, well, I tell you, my feeling on that is if, if any Christian who walks around saying that they never have peaks and valleys, that's yeah. just lying. That's a lie. It's not true. Yeah. It's just yeah. not true. Every mm -hmm. human being I know, Luke, as sure as I look at him right now, as sure as I look at you, I know every single one of us, and we're twice as old as you are, uh, make you look a little younger than he is. We're, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're older, a lot older than you are, and believe me, there have been peaks and there have been valleys. There is no such thing as, as I have always just always walked like a trooper and always done the right thing. It just doesn't happen that way. Life mm -hmm. throws you curveballs. Things happen in life. You learn lessons, and, and I, a lot of times, you know what? I would have never known the joys of other things if I hadn't learned from the failures. So it's a funny experience that comes along with failure, and God to his glory, he uses everything in that way, including failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think getting uh, related to the point you made about uh, uh, who you're hanging out with, um, I, I the, the value of fellowship to me, I've learned from experience, is just you can't even measure how important it is in my life. I, I know that my spiritual growth and maturity uh, uh, went up, what's the word, exponentially uh, when I started getting real fellowship with, with Christians. Uh, when I was trying to be a Christian by myself, uh, it, it was nothing compared to once I started doing Bible studies, being around other Christians all the time, and, you know, trying to, you know, there's this saying that uh, uh, if you have a problem, Find someone else who has a problem and help them with their problem, and then you won't be thinking about yours, you know. And that's part of part of being in fellowship, you know. You you're uh, helping each other to grow, to serve them somehow, washing their feet in in a sense. And uh, when we're when we're having that fellowship, then our spiritual growth and maturity is going to go up like this. But I, I I've came to the conclusion that everybody there's no static Christian. Everybody is either they're either maturing or backsliding, you know. And there's no constant. No one has like for the next thirty years you're going to maintain some constant level of your maturity, you know. So and and so if you start backsliding, the important thing to do is get in the Word of God, pray, have fellowship, do some ministry, start serve other people, and that's when you start growing and maturing again. The more you do these, you get spiritual food, spiritual exercise, spiritual work, then that's when your, your uh, maturity uh, goes. So it, it's important for that reason to, to be with other Christians, but I think that also uh, it's a natural thing for us to want to be with other people who want to talk about Jesus all the time. I mean, I mean, I've got some friends and families that uh, either are less interested or not interested at all, and I'm not going to impose it on them. But I don't have to have to. I don't have to impose it on you. You you guys are here voluntarily because you love to talk about Jesus as much as I do. And so uh, it, when you're around people like that, uh, that's when. As a group, as I said earlier, being alone is a is, is, is real terrible thing as a Christian. You need fellowship. All right, I don't remember where I was now. Um, I don't even remember what we were talking about. <laughs> no, we don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about how oh, heaven, new creations oh. become an oh oh. I remember now. Let me give you this example because I went off on such a tirade there. Um, let's say now I remember uh, on my cheek, my right cheek here when I was younger, I had a cyst grow, and it got large. It got the size of maybe a a, a small grape or a, a kernel of corn. It was obvious to the sight. You could see a bump there. Um, and then eventually, I had the doctor remove it. 
And uh, when he re when he removed that, I didn't become a different person, did he? Did I? And let's take it. Let's take another step further and say, let's say someone has uh, some tendency in their brain. Uh, you, they, if you watch any of these uh, mystery shows and like uh, like Dexter about psychopathic killers and stuff, they talk about parts of the brain that that you can stimulate and it causes certain emotions, certain thoughts, and part of your brain is is uh, controls different uh, functions of your body and um, you could take a part of a person's brain and remove it and they no longer have that that ability or inclination so what happens if we have this sin nature just just cut out and taken out like a tumor out of us and it's just not there anymore well I'm still me God just removed that part of my brain or my my sin nature from me, but it doesn't it hasn't changed who I am. He just cured me. Yeah, the the, the only difficulty I have, I mean, I've, I do agree that that's what happens, but like the thing is, I do think uh, our sin nature is a bigger part of us, unfortunately, than just a cyst or a um, or a tumor or something like that. Yeah, or you know, it's just we are dead in our trespasses and sins, is what it is. Well, well, it is, and that, and that's why it's something that no matter. And this is again why we why we trust in Christ, and we can yeah. totally trust in Christ because it is something that if we could cut off, if we could take away, we would, but we can't. Yeah. It just we can't take it away. Well, it's a two step process. Uh, in this life, uh, see, we got a disease. Uh, we were born with the disease. We inherited this disease called the sin nature, fallen man. Every person born since ever born, Adam and Eve weren't born, so every person ever born was born with this birth defect, sin nature, and uh, uh, so when we get born again, we get that cured spiritually, but we still have the, the sin nature of the flesh, so then when we get resurrected and get a new body, now the second part of the cure comes, and now the body's cured. We don't have a body that has the sin nature. So... The uh, the sinful nature that's uh, the, our problem with our spirit is already solved. Now we just need the problem with our body solved. Exactly. Now, does, does the new nature then, or sorry, does the new body mean that there's no temptation? Because if if, if the answer is yes, then that means Jesus did not have the the new body because he was tempted to sin a few times and refused and did the right thing always and refused to do it. But, but that was wait a minute, but what, yes, but he he couldn't be. But that was before the resurrection. He wasn't resurrected at that point. Right. And so he, he, had, he had a flawed still, body then. He yeah, he would have. Well, yeah. clearly he did. It could be killed. It could be harmed. It could be. Yeah. It could be. You know, he could be. His um, he couldn't. Once he was resurrected, he couldn't be killed or any of those things happened to him as well. Yeah. So, um, but in that regard, it, it's 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 a good way to look at it. I'm glad Luke brought that back up. It was something else Randy said that I wanted to kind of build on a little bit just for a second, which is. And this is where I think some of the confusion maybe comes from. Maybe if I say this, people understand it a little bit better. It's not that God makes our spirits come to heaven because our bodies uh, aren't supposed to. It's that our bodies can't. They can't go to heaven they, because they are corrupt. They are not. They cannot go to heaven. When Christ, when we believe and when we trust in Christ as our Savior, and we put our faith in Him, He perfects the spirit. So when we die in our spirit, we've been perfected. The spirit inside wars with the flesh. The flesh is corrupt. It's not that the body is not supposed to come with us. It's that it can't. And it's God's prerogative that he decided to do that all at one time at the resurrection of the saints and, and the, for the resurrected of those who died and then those who uh, are still alive in Christ at the rapture. That's his prerogative to choose to do it all at one time. But when we die and our, our spirit goes to heaven, but our body cannot because it's corrupt. Not because it's not supposed to, but because it can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, uh, you asked the question: Will we have temptation uh, in eternity? Uh, I don't know how we can have temptation. I mean, uh, the devil won't be there to tempt us. We right. were only going to have we're go only going to have resurrected people with no sin nature there. So your neighbor's not going to be there tempting you, right? So I don't. Maybe there will be no temptation. I I don't see who's going to be. How could you be tempted? No, they will have no sex drive. Then. Yeah. Well, if you're thinking of as sex as being one of the main uh, temptations, then uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, and we're going to discuss that in future chapter here about 
sex and marriage and all that in, 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 in heaven. And uh, so I don't want to jump ahead because I don't even remember what he says about it. But uh, 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 yeah, I, I just think that, uh, I mean, I know Joe Byron loves the idea of having sex in, in eternity and in, <laughs> still, being, still being with his wife, you know. And, you know, uh, I don't think anybody, in fairness to Joe, I don't think anybody looks at it as a bad thing, but I just, just don't think it will be there. But, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I think of marriage <laughs> as a bad thing. Marriage? Uh, marriage. Well, yeah, well, we, as I said, let's not go too far ahead on that topic because yeah. there's, in it, there's in several chapters that yeah, cause, go into like the, detail. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just quickly say like the Mormons are often advertising eternal marriage as part of their religion, and to me that sounds horrible. That sounds lamatrocious, <laughs> and they and they come up to me like like it's a good thing. It's like wow, you're just like it's almost like advertising. It's like come to Joe's junkyard where we have extremely foul smelling trash. Uh -huh. That's what it's like when the Mormons advertise that. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to have to struggle with uh, you know sexual temptations in eternity, Jackson. So don't worry about that. Um, conversion does not mean eliminating the old, but transforming it. Despite the radical changes that occur through salvation, death, and resurrection, we remain who we are. We have the same history, appearance, memory, interests, and skills. This is the principle of redemptive continuity. God will not scrap his original creation and start over. Instead, he will take his fallen, corrupted children and restore, refresh, and renew us to our original design. We'll have our same history, appearance, memory, interests, and skills. Well, there's a can of worms for Jackson. You know, interests... You you might jump to the conclusion. Well, you still have those still sin interest interest in sin, but yeah. we're not going to have we're not going to have that. I do I do think that uh, the memory is important because without memory, uh, I don't think we would even be our ourself. Our, our memory is what makes you who you are. Uh, out apart from your body, your body is who you are too. But it's uh, if you had no memory. Uh, if your memory was wiped clean and you went to heaven, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> you, know you wouldn't even know you went to heaven. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, where's, where's the joy in that? You're in heaven, but you're a different person. You don't even know who you were. And then, and then, and then when, you, when, when Christ judges you as a Christian for your actions, good or bad, you'd be standing there saying, I don't remember, I don't know what you're talking about. I got no clue yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, interests and skills. He says interests and skills will will be retained. So, wait, will I still be interested in golf? I mean, I often think, well, uh, I'm hoping that uh, in eternity uh, there can be some great golf courses I never got to play on the earth, and they're going to even be maybe even far better than they are now. Like, I'd love to play Pebble Beach, and and, and it's too expensive. I'd love to play uh, Augusta, but it's a private membership. So maybe I'll be able to play those golf courses, and they'll be even much better than they are. Or maybe my interest will be in other things will be so much greater that my my interest in golf will seem like, oh, that's not even that interesting to me anymore. I don't know. You're going to still have your interest in video games, Jackson? Sure, if there are video games there. <laughs> It's so fun. It's so funny that you said all that, Luke. Because the thing about the golf courses, I literally said that verbatim the other day. I mean, it was exactly the same thing you said. The exact two courses that I picked out. I said, yeah, yeah, I I love golf, but I never get to play. I never have the time. I don't have. I can't afford it. I can't do it. You know, but. Yeah, I'd sure love to be able to, to think that, you know, somehow when everything's done and we're in eternity, I could play Pebble Beach one day or play Augusta one day or play – I said it was yeah. just too funny. That's too funny. Well, here's, here's, here's the thing. It's kind of interesting you mentioned the video games thing because, see, us ASD people get so obsessed with things and just love being obsessed with it, basically, and just – love to get out of it like like you know a lot of people a lot like 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 a lot and, and if this is you either either one of you two or someone listening to this please don't think I'm saying this is bad but a lot of people come to 
come to faith in Christ and everything because they see the world as being ultimately empty, which it is and everything, and they're looking for something to kind of fill that void, and sometimes they believe on Christ and become a disciple and everything. See, that's not at all the experience for me What uh, in the slightest. I'm just really happy just kind of doing my own thing, being in my own world and everything. But then, you know, you got to realize that salvation is not something to joke around about or mess around about. It's very, very serious and everything. So the logical answer, if you're afraid of, of the horrible consequences of being unsaved, is to get saved. And then when that happens, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. So when I'm obsessively pursuing interest and there's sin involved, then it starts to kind of hurt a little bit along the way, you know, like a little... Mm -hmm. Almost like a like like a shock collar on a dog is the best way I can describe it. Being a Christian and and being in sin or whatever, you know. But uh, I think what you're saying is exactly right because and you're pointing out the the point that we're talking about in the book right now, which is this is what differentiates us. This is what makes us who we are and different as people. I mean, you, it, that's why it, that's why life in general as a Christian and then life in eternity will pertain to people differently. It'll 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 speak to different people differently. Right, right. And what I'm saying now about just Luke mentioning the interest thing, you know, is just it's hard for me to imagine. I guess like 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 I guess what I what I think of when I think of paradise is just being able to pursue or basically live in my own world, basically. In, in, a, in a place where I don't have to worry about aging or that kind of thing or anything like that, which heaven will be like that. But the thing I've always struggled with uh, as a Christian ASD person is it seems like my reality of what would be a paradise would be something selfish, and God cannot be selfish. But if it's not selfish and if it's not sin, how could it possibly be a perfect paradise? That's a question I've, I've thought about a lot. So. Mm hmm Hmm. Like, for example, uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron had this video where they said one of the marks of a true Christian is they're not always they're not spending all their free time and personal hobbies and everything. It's like, wow, apparently no autistic person is saved, according to them. Mm. But, yeah. but, well, anyway, but, but, you know, on the other side of that, remember, and this, this gets into the whole will be, will be the same yet different, is that that may be a whole other side of you that you gain that you're unfamiliar with that you're going to find you have great joy in is that you no longer have the desire to kind of do your own thing. When you get to heaven and you're perfected, one of the things you may gain is a feeling that you now have this feeling that you want to share with people more than you used to, that you don't want to just do things by yourself. It's, it's just another way of saying you're the same person in your likes, your interests, but – the, it added to that are, is going to become a different person who is now open to things that maybe you weren't open to before. Maybe you will feel like you to some extent. Have to some extent. I don't. I hope there's not like a shot that makes me a neurotypical as soon as I get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. Then you would be a different person, but but the, the uh, you wouldn't be the same person you are because that's part of your identity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, on the other t hand, maybe it, w it will be something that is um, m more uh, 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 that fits better within within the, the the all the the people in heaven, you know, so that you're a better fit. So you're not, you're not feeling like you got to be off by yourself all the time doing your own thing. You might uh, other people you might find, but oh man, I find that Jackson really interesting. I want to spend a lot of time with him. And you might say, hey. Some of these people are a lot more interesting than, than they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. You're, you're going to find that things you didn't find were so interesting, may, maybe now renewed, are going to be more interesting to you now. It's, it's like, yeah. yeah, I'll tell you, Jackson, I, there, there's a lot of people in the world that I'm not very interested in spending time <laughs> with, too. So it's not you don't have to be uh, yeah. what even neurotypicals uh, people yeah. – or not necessarily want to be sociable all the time. It, no, no. It just, it well, just I, mean, I guess I, 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 I also think that, that it may be, I don't think they'll, that in heaven it'll be like every single minute of every single day we're interacting with someone else. You know, maybe we will have quiet time still. Oh, and, sure. No, I, I, no, you know absolutely. What I'm no, absolutely. And, and I think so too. I think, I think you'll have time to yourself. I think you'll, of course, I think you'll have time to yourself. I mean, just to, I mean, I mean, okay. For instance, if you, it's it's not selfish of you to say, hey, I'd like to take some time to go relax on a beach somewhere and enjoy the feeling of the breeze and. 
do some fishing by myself and just have some time to relax. And There's nothing wrong with that, inherently wrong with that feeling like you want to do some things by yourself. But you've got to remember, we're talking about eternity here. You're going to have plenty of time to do stuff with yourself and with other people. So there will yeah. be you'll be you'll be able to do all these things you want to do. You got to be in eternity to do it. Yeah, yeah that's right. And you you it's it would be even be okay to say uh, you know that saying don't put off today what you could t tomorrow t what you could do today. Well, in eternity, there's no reason to. Oh, I can put it off. I can put it off. I want to do now. Oh, right. <laughs> The, the yeah. thing too, the thing I like, the, the thing I really like the concept of eternity too is there'll be nothing to be missed ever. You know what I'm saying? Like I think everyone will know each other on some level. You know, mm. like the, like I, yeah. I thought. So man, there's so many books, like so many good fiction books I'd like to read, and there's no way in my lifetime I'll be able to read every single one that I would like. Maybe whereas in heaven it'll be like. That's one thing is maybe there'll be some really cool fictional books in heaven for all we know. Uh, and that and that's the same Jackson. That's the same exact thing. Like me and Luke were talking about with, for us it was with the golf thing or fishing or or whatever yeah. because it's like you yeah. know, we never get the time. We can't go to these places and 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 play in places. We never get the opportunity to play in some of these places or do things in these places. But then you know exactly like you said. There are, these moments won't be missed. Sometime you can do it. Sometime you can you can do time. Yeah. And and you will. And you right, exactly. No, I believe there's no reason to believe it that your interests, you know, as as long as they don't pertain to sin, your interests uh, wouldn't be there for you in heaven. You're, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well maybe if they do pertain to sin, the sinful aspect will be removed of it. So Okay, you, right. Yeah. Well, like Mitch is always talking about, you know, drinking alcohol, but in that instance we can enjoy it simply for the for the enjoyment of it and we don't get drunk. It's it's simply right, right. It and it's you know, we you know, you like a, like a good cold beer on a hot day, you like you know, you have a nice cold beer, you know. It's... Yeah. Well I think you can probably I can answer every one of your questions uh by just saying, Jackson. You're going to be very, very happy, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, you know. Either you're going to be able to do all these things you like doing now, and you'll you'll have time to do, plenty of time to do them, and you will. Well, and, and, and let me let me make myself clear. I believe that a hundred percent. It's yeah. just that I'm logically trying to analyze how that's possible. Yes, I already sure. believe that that's true. Does, does yeah. that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. sure. yeah. Yes. Like we again, as we discuss all this, uh, I don't think there's. Uh, a whole lot of real clear-cut answers on all these things we're discussing. You know, uh, it's all theoretical, uh, and we we try to uh, learn as much as we can from see what the scriptures say about it, and it's conjecture. Uh, but the bottom line is, we're going to be so happy, happier than we've ever been all the time, and therefore that means you're either going to get to read all those novels or else you'll find something else that's so much more interesting that you don't have any <laughs> care about the novels because something else is far better. You're right. Okay, uh, theologian Herman Bavink, writing in the early 20th century, argued that a parallel continuity exists between the old and the new earth. Quote, God's honor consists precisely and uh, consists precisely in the fact that he redeems and renews the same humanity, the same world, the same heaven, and the same earth that have been corrupted and polluted by sin. Just as anyone in Christ is a new creation in whom the old has passed away and everything has become new, so this world passes away in its present form as well in order out of its womb at God's word of power to give birth and being to a new world. That was kind of wordy. Hmm. All right, I don't think there's anything anything in there new that in what we've been saying. Um, the new earth will still be earth, but a changed earth. It will be converted and resurrected, but it will still be earth and recognizable as such. Uh, just as those reborn through salvation maintain continuity with the people they were, so too the world will be reborn in continuity with the old world. In fact, writes Bevink, 
quote, the birth of humans is completed in the rebirth of creation. The kingdom of God is fully realized only when it is visibly extended over the earth as well, unquote. So this, this idea of continuity is really what they're, they're trying to make, uh, make the point, that uh, uh, it's, it's a continuation of who you are, just everything's better. I like, you know, when I, was, when I was skinny, I was still Luke. When I got really fat, I was still Luke, but not as good. And then I lost weight, and I'm still Luke, but better, better, healthier, and feeling better. But I still got arthritis and problems, uh, and I'm with with those. I'm still me. Uh, and and then when uh, all of the pain and sickness and everything is out of my life, I'm still going to be me. But uh, even though all these changes are taking place, it's still me. If we don't grasp redemptive continuity, we cannot understand the nature of our resurrection. Quote, there must be continuity, unquote, writes Anthony Hokema, uh, quote, for otherwise there would be little point in speaking about resurrection at all. The calling into existence of a completely new set of people, totally different from the present inhabitants of the earth, would not be a resurrection, unquote. I agree with them that this is a critical point, that, that, that it's the only way it really could be. Yeah. And it's important for us to understand that it's got to be us. You know, it's got to be us. If it's not us, then there's no resurrection. It's, you're not really even going to have it if it's not you, if it's some new person. Continuity is evident in passages that discuss resurrection, including 1 Corinthians 15.53, quote, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, unquote. It is this, the perishable and mortal, which puts on that, the imperishable and immortal. Likewise, it is we, the very same people who walk this earth, who will walk the new earth. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Um, I like this idea, putting it on. Uh, we put on immortality. Mm -hmm. uh, we put on this new uh, sinless perfection, this uh, no sin nature. It's, we put it on. It's still me, but I'm, I'm just clothed in this, uh, with this new uh, thing. So it, I'm clothed with immortality. I'm clothed with sinless perfection. What do you think of that, Jackson? I mean... Clothed is, 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 is one way of putting it, but like cleansed is another way you could think of it because I don't think it's going to be like we're acting in sinless. Like, 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 for example, if I'm walking in the spirit right now and I try really hard not to sin and whatnot, oftentimes it, I could still be inside thinking, oh, this is so hard, this is so hard or whatever, whereas this seems to me more like it's just going to all feel so natural, as natural yeah. as anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or I, I still think uh, of all of the examples, the one that seems to make most sense to me is like the the, the brain surgery, you know. Uh, uh, if 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 this sin nature was some part of my brain, and then and then God just surgically removed it, I'm still me. It's just I don't have to deal with this. That part of my brain's gone, so I don't have to be tempted. But I don't have the sin nature anymore. Uh, that seems to me like a simple way of uh, it, that works for me. Better than better than clothing or cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's like a surgical remover removal. <laughs> uh, I think I think one of the one of the most attractive aspects of heaven to me is it's not going to feel like something you're forcing yourself to do because you have to or whatever. That's one of the most attractive aspects of heaven to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the nature of our new bodies. Uh, the, the empty tomb is the ultimate proof that Christ's resurrection body was the same body that died on the cross. If resurrection meant the creation of a new body, 
Christ's original body would have remained in the tomb. When Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection, quote, it is I myself, unquote, he was emphasizing to them that he was the same person in spirit and body who had gone to the cross. His disciples saw the marks of his crucifixion, unmistakable evidence that this was the same body. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not just a... Yeah, it's not just a new body. Uh, yeah, I wonder if we'll be wearing glasses in heaven. Uh, probably just to look cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how they're going to need it. Or maybe maybe like one of, there'll be some eternal reward, like x-ray glasses <laughs> or supervision or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I see. I was thinking. See, in in any way that we're limited, whether it's arthritis, like Luke was saying, or whether it's like you know, they deal with neck and back pain sometimes. Um, you know, all those things, eyesight issues. Those, those things are going to be. That's part of perfecting. It's part of your body. The body as you know it being perfected. You lose all that. There's no. There's no yeah. sickness. There's no death. I there's don't no. Like the way I look without glasses. <laughs> Like I'm that? sure you're. I'm sure you're not gonna have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just. I'm messing around, Luke. I said I don't like the way I look without. Doesn't glasses. like the way he looks without. Oh, like, can, you, can you restore my whole body except for that? <laughs> I still have. Well, no, you, said you can. You can wear. He said you can wear the glasses. They're just not doing anything for you. <laughs> like, or they're an eternal reward, giving me super right. extra eyes or something like that. <laughs> well, let me ask you. If, let's say. Let's say that someone was. Um, you know, really, really overweight. And let's say they're 500 pounds. I'm not just someone who's just slightly overweight or even morbid obesity, but 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 is uh, just extreme. 500 pound person, and they're and they're saved, and then they get resurrected. Uh, what would you think? You think that their glorified body is going to be 500 pounds? Uh, uh, that's that's what they had. Uh, are they going to are they going to look the same? And if they didn't, if they were let's say 180 pounds in the resurrection, they were would look a lot different. Uh, would people even recognize them? No, I'd say I'd say I'd say they would not. They would not be 500 pounds. No, they would not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it would, but nor, nor would nor would they desire to be 500 pounds. If you ask the same person when you went to heaven, do you want to be 500 pounds? I doubt anybody would say, "Oh yeah, I'd love to be 500 pounds." Yeah. I don't think anyone would say that. Okay, let's say let's say somebody had a uh, a feature. You'd be surprised, though, Eric, what some people like. Believe it or not, so, yeah. there are some strange people who like strange oh, things. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> let's say somebody had a physical feature. That they didn't like. Uh, let's say that they had a, like a complex or something because their nose was extremely large or something, you know. And, and uh, uh, would do you think they'll they'll have that same physical appearance with that very very large nose in eternity, or would there be some kind of cosmetic surgery to make their nose exactly how they'd like it, you know? And if so, would it really be them if they didn't have the big nose because that was part of who they were? Or will the vanity, will that kind of thing, like your physical appearance, how you look, will even be a, a question? Some people probably, let's say some people are really beautiful in life and they, they're used to that and that's what they expect. And other people are homely and, and that's what they kind of expect themselves to be, but they'd rather look better. I, I have an answer to that question, I think. I think they are going to look a combination of what your desire is and what God's idea of perfection is. That is what they're going to look like. Yeah. So now the big it, question it, is, does that include glasses? <laughs> <laughs> like I like I said, if you want to wear them, they just aren't doing anything for you. But hey, if you want to wear them, go ahead. <laughs> no, here, here's just the thing. The thing about about glasses is, you know, that's become a part of our culture and whatnot. You know, nobody 
thinks, oh, that person's weird because they're wearing glasses or something like that. No. But if I was the only person on Earth who wore glasses, like, what are those things on that guy's eyes or something <laughs> like that? I don't think that's what I would like. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... I, I like the eternal reward idea of x-ray vision, though. <laughs> Uh, X-ray vision, <laughs> or heat vision, like Suran, or it's like Cyclops, or I don't know. Why would you need X-ray vision if you could just blink your eye and appear close to something to see it close up? Because it'd be interesting to uh, like, like when you, if, if there are reptiles and amphibians in heaven, to do scientific studies without having to dissect them and everything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? There's a. If you really uh, take the governor off, or you know, and and just allow yourself to really ask every question you really think of, you know, it's really interesting. But it can really get a little bit, you know, like inane too, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't want to put any uh, like restrictions on any question is is interesting to discuss, even though some people say, well, gee. That's, that's that's not worthy of discussing heaven. But hey, there's a lot of questions. Matter of fact, as we get farther in the book, he, a matter of fact, uh, about the second half of the book is just nothing but questions. All the questions people ask about heaven, you know, like here's one of the favorite questions. Uh, a lot of people wonder. I love pets. My my beloved pets. Will my pets be in heaven too? Yeah, you know. I wonder. So there's there's one, but there's there's like a hundred questions like that. And we'll be getting to all those things, but the, there's no question. I think that is like, you know, a stupid question. Oh, why do you have to ask that? No, every question is worth 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 considering. You know, like we'd like, do we produce earwax in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> or even will you really, have... Luke? I'm going to really challenge that. I'm going to try to think of some of the <laughs> silliest <laughs> questions. <laughs> And he knew you were going that direction, which is kind of why he said he said. <laughs> Yeah, you already crossed the line. Well, I'm going to really put that to the test. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay, um, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. It says, Christ's resurrected life is the model for ours. Not only do we know that our present bodies, uh, what our present bodies are like, we also have an example in Scripture of what a resurrection body is like. We're told a great deal about Christ's resurrected body, and we're told that our bodies will be like His. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. That's Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Could you look that up, Eric, so we get the whole thing? Philippians 3.20 and 2.21. Hold on a second. Hey, Jackson, I got one for you, too. Okay. Uh, 1 John 3.2. Okay. What, what, what were those two Philippians again? Philippians 20. chapter 3, verse 20.21. 20, 20 and 21, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, verse 20 is, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Okay, so he's going to fashion our body to be like his glorious, glorified body. Mm -hmm. So this is, is saying his glorified body that was the resurrected Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that that's the model mm -hmm. for us. We're going to be uh, just like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jackson, what's your say? Uh, very good verse. Um, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay. Uh, and Eric, could you look up 1 Corinthians 15, 49? Uh, so we're going to be like him. We're going to be uh, uh, made like him. So 
First Corinthians fifteen forty nine says, "And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly." Okay. Okay. So he's given us three verses here that uh, give us the um, the idea that when we're resurrected, we're going to be like Jesus when he was resurrected. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the ideas that we're, we've been we've been alluding to, we're going to go into much more detail uh, on on this uh, now, or in the next episode. But the point is, these resurrected bodies, uh, we don't have to like guess and wonder so much about them. All we got to do is look at the example, the model. Jesus Christ's resurrected body is the model, and we're going to be all modeled or made to be like that. Okay. Uh, so this is a good place for us to, to stop and make our final remarks here. And uh, and end our two hour show here. Okay. Uh, Eric, uh, any any uh, things stand out? Uh, in the discussion today that uh, is worth uh, re-emphasizing? I think it just build, builds really on all the things that we had already said. I mean, I mean, when we look at well, – I'm glad we finished up with those verses in Philippians because right there – I mean this is why I keep bringing it up, why you bring it up, why others bring it up. It clearly says that the model for us – is what we experience, what the apostles experienced in his glorified body. He had an intention. You know, God doesn't do things just to show off. He does things for a purpose. When Jesus appeared in his glorified body, it was to show us what we were looking for, what what we were looking to, the glorified body, the resurrected body. He showed us things it could do. He showed us – so he was giving us a taste of that. And so – you know, God made us as human beings, as we are, to manipulate the physical world. It's why we were done, to manipulate physical things. And there's no reason to believe why we wouldn't do that when we go into heaven and why we wouldn't do that into eternity. We talked a little bit about um, what we might be able to do, what we might not be able to do. You know, there's often times in the Bible where a verse means a couple of different things. Um, there's a line in Scripture, and I can't remember the exact verse. Maybe you can remember off the top of your head, but I can't. But there's a verse, a verse that mentions that with the faith of a mustard seed, we can say to that mountain, move from its place and be cast into the sea, and it will. Now, we know we can't move mountains. We can't literally take a mountain and throw it from its place and put it in a sea. But maybe we will. I mean, it's, maybe, that, maybe that verse had two meanings. Not only, not only moving spiritual mountains and, and being able to – change history in people or anything else you know, by ideas and principles and change people and save people. But not only that, but maybe in eternity he meant what he said in a very physical way too. Maybe in eternity we'll take part in some grand things that are going to take place where there are little hints and things that the, that, that the Bible puts in there to kind of give us little hints about things we'll be able to do. Maybe that means two things. I uh, really loved the mountain into the sea uh, point you made. I, I really, I uh, never really put a drink, thought of bringing that into this topic. I thought you, uh, uh, you that really drives the point home that uh, the po the possible the possibilities for us in the future, and uh, uh, as we know, we got the the universe is a giant creation. It's just, here on Earth is just a, a almost a, the Earth is almost like a um, molecule uh, in in a um, in the in the universe. I mean, there's so many planets and solar systems and galaxies. It's so vast that the Earth is so small. It, it, I suspect that. Uh, we're not going to be moving mountains on the earth, but uh, maybe we will be masters of the universe, and we will be set off to do these types of things all over the universe. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's just something maybe we'll discuss more as we go along in the book here. Uh, very good point, Eric. Uh, Jackson, what, uh, what stood out for, to you in the discussion today? Um, 
frankly, the, 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 the concept of how much we don't know is what's standing out to me more than anything, you know. It's, I think that there's, we got to realize with our finite minds, we're never going to understand everything about this or whatever, and we're, we need to keep a humility there. But at the same time, I kind of am glad because that means, I think, like a, a point I've made in the past, that surprise, you know, pleasant surprise will be an element of heaven, too. And we're not, I think God purposely doesn't reveal everything about it. It's kind of like what we're doing right now is almost like watching the trailer of a movie and everything. Can you imagine if they revealed the plot twist in the trailer and everything like that? That would be terrible. <laughs> But, and by the way, I think, Eric, the verse you were referring to about the mustard seed is Mark 4.31, which reads, it is, the, like, it is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than the seeds that be in the earth. And he, the, the 4.30 is talking about like the kingdom of God. But anyway, that, I guess that just sort of summarizes my thoughts at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the idea of the trailer to a movie. Uh, you're right. Um, I think it, in John he says that Jesus has done so much that if, if we were to know everything, it would fill up all so many more books. Uh, that, uh, uh, and that's the way it is with it's what we know. Uh, we have the scriptures, and the scriptures tell us a lot of important things. And we try to um, um, uh, infer from them uh, and come to conclusions, uh, but a lot of it is is uh, speculation, and it's a lot of fun to do it. But how much do, can we really know? Uh, we we if we just know like like Einstein said, we we don't even know one percent of nothing, <laughs> you know. So. But fortunately, we have the scriptures, so we have some really great things to be excited about. Uh, and and uh, maybe it is like that trailer, oh, here's enough to get you really excited, but you don't really have a clue how great, great this movie really is. You know? yeah. right. And uh, The thing that uh, was, uh, I think, important about the study t today was the idea of this continuity and the, the fact that, uh, hey, no, we're not going to be... Our, our, it's our actual bodies are going to be resurrected, and, and it's not just an absolute new body. The earth is going to be resurrected. It's just not going to be a brand new earth. It's going to be the same old, same earth, but he's going to build it back up and make it even better, and the same with our bodies. And it, that includes the continuity of our identity, of our memories, our consciousness, our personalities, and so on, and yet we'll, we'll be... Uh, 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 without it, without that sin nature, without the fallen and the fall and the curse affecting creation. Um, okay, uh, we're going to go in a lot more detail about these resurrected bodies and, and the, what it's going to be like in the next episode. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, but for now, let's let's end the show, and we don't want to end the show without um, telling someone how they can have all this in. in in heaven, the the new heaven, the new work in eternity, how, how you can live forever on the earth, where in a, in a state of paradise, where everything is perfect, with God and with all those of us who love God and Jesus Christ, you can you can live like that forever and be have this wonderful joy and bliss and happiness forever and ever. You can do that. It's uh, it's not something that is not available to you, but you have to know the way to get this. And uh, Eric, do you know the way, the way to get the eternal life in this uh, new heaven and new earth? Absolutely. And for anyone out there listening, that way is does not mean uh, restrictions and bogged down with the law and anything of that nature. God made that that capability. He wanted you to enjoy. Uh, heaven. He wanted you to enjoy eternity. He knows our limitations. And as hard as we try to build a ladder to that place or to build our own way to that place, it is impossible by our deeds to do that. But the good news is that God, knowing that about us, provided that special way. He provided that way for us, knowing that we were incapable of building that way for ourselves. And that way is Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus Christ to, to die, to shed his blood on all our behalf for our sins, so that 
all of us who simply trust completely in that and put Christ on, just trust him and, and trust everything in what he did at the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that the victory, that he proved it by by rising again from the, from the dead. Um, just putting your whole faith in that, that that covers you, that that is the price, that that was the cost to be paid, and trusting in that he did it for you. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Everything else will come along with your growth in the Holy Spirit and your growth as a Christian. You, you'll desire to do better th for the Lord. You'll desire to walk closer to Him. But as far as achieving salvation, it is simply putting your entire faith and, and trust in what Jesus has already done for you. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, so um, I, I have a video, uh, tell, tell them the good news. It's the, it's the uh, featured video on my channel. I made it several years ago, uh, but but I, I I make the point first of saying first I want to ask people, do you want to go to heaven? And you know I've actually met some people who said no, I don't want to go to heaven. Uh, and if they don't want to go to heaven, then then that's that's okay. I mean I can't twist their arm, but I'm hoping that if as people watch these videos that we're making now about heaven. That if you had no desire before to go to heaven, now that you're learning about it, maybe you'll have that desire. And you say, yes, yes, I, I want to live forever in this heaven. And uh, if that's the case, we want you to know the way to get there. And as Eric said, there's one way. Jesus Christ is the way. And so um, all, all you've got to do is just uh, rely on him completely. He's the way. Uh, as Eric said, he, he paid for your sins, so sin's not an issue anymore. Uh, and, and the only question is, uh, are you going to receive the gift? He's offering it to you now. He said, I died for your sins. I raised myself from the dead, proving that I'm God and I can give you life everlasting. Do you want it? If you want it, he's reaching out, handing it to you right now. Just receive it from him. Put your faith completely in him. Reject everything else as a solution. There's one solution. Jesus Christ. There's one way. You can't do it any other way. Acknowledge that and say, I need Jesus. Be my Savior and, and he'll give you eternal life. If you do that, make a comment on the video, please, because we'd love to, to hear that good news. Uh, so what, thank you for watching this and I thank the panelists for participating uh, and uh, we'll be uh, on again every Sunday and Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.